And as if Offenati didn't have enough problems, scientists reckon that this whole area, this region, has subsided uh, well over a meter. And in the next couple of days, the region is also expecting the highest tides of the year. The sea is some 500 meters down there, um, and yet up here we have this. It's a remarkable sight by any standards, a huge tug which has been brought all the way up here by the tsunami. Um, and what's remarkable about it, or what's even more remarkable about it, is that, that uh, what it says about the size of the tsunami. Because the Japan Meteorological Center have just produced provisional estimates saying that the tsunami that hit this region was about three and a half meters high. Uh, now, we're seven, eight metres above sea level here, uh, and even given the surge, the fact that it could bring that all the way up here does suggest that the tsunami here was a lot higher than three and a half metres. Even amidst such chaos, this seems strange. Boats, trucks and cars were dumped on top of buildings, much higher than the recorded height of the wave. That happens because as the water's pushing through restricted areas like the streets of towns and villages, it's being effectively funneled. And the water's got to go somewhere, and so it goes up as it's squeezed and funneled and pushes material, pushes cars onto roofs, sometimes as high as 50 feet. So in areas, the, the impact of this will be even greater, particularly where you get narrow streets. Once the wave starts to pick up, uh, part of a town, the, the warehouses along the dock, the debris and all that, then it becomes more like a glacier. You know, it's a, it's a moving wall of debris. And the more mass it has, the more power it has as it comes in. It doesn't really look like water beyond some point. It looks like the entire town is flowing in, and, and it is. So all the mass of all the buildings, cars, refrigerators, and everything that's in that wall, it's essentially a debris glacier at that point, and it just keeps coming in. This is Minami Sanriku, a town that was wiped off the map. Ninety-five percent of the buildings destroyed. Over 10,000 people, half the population missing. This place, Minami San Luco, probably symbolizes the tragedy more than anywhere. An entire town wiped out by the force of nature. It's almost difficult to imagine one's thoughts as one sees this coming towards you. And as it hits the coast, it's then picking up all the debris, it's picking up buildings, cars and things, and you then end up with this sort of really quite horrific mass moving through towns, villages, across fields, causing complete destruction. I mean, it would be bad enough if it was only water, uh, but because it's full of cars and you can't, you can't swim against it or flow with it or do anything, you're just in a, like in front of a bulldozer of, of moving the entire town. It's funny that when you hear that sound of an ambulance, it kind of uh, actually gives you hope that they might have found somebody alive. Although that must be happening fewer and fewer times between anyone who did survive and was trapped would almost certainly have died of hypothermia by now. At the town of Rikuzen Takata, rescue workers hunt for survivors and discover the dead. When they find a body, they put a large stick in the ground with a flag attached to it so that it can be recovered later. It's a fairly gruesome and sad task. In fact, they're not just collecting bodies, they're also collecting 
personal mementos as well, which they find, um, like this. I'm afraid what we have here is more bodies waiting to be taken away. Even now, the tsunami was not finished with Japan. Back at the Fukushima power plant, what started as a failed generator was fast becoming the biggest nuclear crisis since Chernobyl. We'll keep the windows closed and uh, I'll put on a mask. Scientists have already gathered more data from Japan's earthquake and tsunami than from any other disaster in history. As Professor Roger Billum returns to Tokyo from his aerial survey, the city's vulnerability becomes all too clear. There are 30 million people within about two meters of sea level and uh, a tsunami here, of course, would be absolutely devastating. Suddenly, a problem. We had a big earthquake just now, so... Oh, really? Yeah. We've just learned from the ground that there was an earthquake that damaged the heavy heliport. They're checking for damage right now. We don't know how big the earthquake was, but it was obviously a, a very uh, a nearby aftershock. A massive aftershock has hit Tokyo. Magnitude 6.2. In the week that followed the main quake, there were over 500 aftershocks along the fault. This is the actual data from seismometers around Japan. The larger the circle, the bigger the aftershock. The shaking is now stopped, so I'll just continue landing. Finally, Billum's helicopter is given the all clear to land. Even at the heliport in Tokyo, the damage is plain to see. I noticed that the tarmac here, which should be beautifully dark everywhere, in fact stained white in places, and you can see that in fact sand has come out of this crack, and there's another one over there, another one over there. We're very close to the shoreline, and the lurching motion of the uh, ground during the earthquake has caused the subsurface liquefied sands to come belching out on the top. Precisely the same phenomenon, liquefaction, that was filmed during the earthquake. And over here is an old mud volcano. Um, uh, old, it's about three days old. You can see how the mud came pouring out of the top there. So look, we're 200 miles from the epicenter here, and here's a crack in uh, uh, the heliport landing area. It, it continues all the way along here. You can actually see down about uh, three feet in places. Uh, splits into two here. This goes over here. You can see an offset in the... Um, in this uh, trim around the, uh, the tarmac. As the Earth's crust shattered during the main quake, new stresses spread along the fault. Relieve the pressure in one place, and it builds up elsewhere, triggering aftershocks. What you're seeing here is how those aftershocks happened over a period of about a week after the main shock. And that orange region, delineated by those orange dots, uh, essentially gives you a feeling for the uh, area of the fault uh, along the plate boundary that ruptured in this event. Every aftershock takes its toll on an already frightened population. Journalist Callum McRae has been moved by the plight of the people here. In the regional capital of Sendai, the temporary shelters are full. But in a darkened, ravaged city, it seems one person at least is trying to cling to normality.